What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I want to talk about the SQR Docs landscape of current tech. What do I mean by that? I want to talk about different tools that exist today. They use artificial intelligence to allow you to query or interact with your documents uh, so that you can ask questions, you can learn from them, etc. Imagine you have a bunch of PDFs, a bunch of papers, a bunch of books, and you know maybe you don't have time to read them all maybe you don't want to read them all but you do still want information from those uh, pdfs and papers how can we semantically query those documents and retrieve the information that we want right and uh, in the large language model space this type of technology is known as rack or retrieval augmented generation right which are systems that are uh, they have the, the large language model itself is augmented by specific knowledge from a book a pdf etc and you know you can query that pdf that document to you know search for information about whatever you want to search for and i've done videos in the past talking about how to talk to papers how to talk to pdfs and this is one technology that I really think it's uh, has a lot of potential in terms of changing kind of like the paradigm that we have today about how we do research, because it allows for some very fascinating, let's call it programmatic extensions of traditional research. And when I say traditional research, uh, research here, I don't mean like a whole encompassing definition. I just mean something like people usually read papers, investigate certain hypotheses from these um, many, many papers that are out there, and then they formulate their hypotheses, they do experiments, they raise evidence about something, etc. What I think the Courier Docs type of technology kind of makes it possible is for us to systematize the process of investigating semantic information inside papers, inside books, to you know, further the uh, range of things that we can look for, search, research, et cetera, right? So let's just uh, take it from the beginning. So today we have a bunch of interesting options when it comes to um, the Courier Docs approach. Let's talk about some simple ones. Uh, I'm going to open AI PDF. Now, AI uh, PDF is a plugin for ChatGPT. I'm going to open it up right here uh, in my, I have ChatGPT Plus. So I'm going to go to pl plugins and then I'm going to go to AI PDF, right? And okay, so now what I can do is I can go to a paper. Let's go to the paper. Attention is all you need, which is the foundational paper about transformers, right? I'm going to go here to the page of that paper. I'm going to copy the URL and then I'm going to go back to ChatGPT and I'm going to say, can you summarize this paper, please? And then I'm going to give it the URL, right? So now the uh, the plugin is going to be accessed as you guys are seeing here, and we're going to have access to, we're going to have the ability to query that specific paper for information and so on and so forth. So as you can see, uh, the plugin is already, has already been called and, and it's already ran. And now it's saying, ah, oh, so the paper is attention is all you need. It argues that the architecture, the transformers architecture is based on attention mechanisms all performing existing sequence transduction models that rely on current convolutional neural networks. And then it gives some wonderful key points. As you guys can see, it's, it, it works great, right? And I can even come here and ask specific information about the paper. So for example, let's go to the paper real quick. Uh, I could go here to the paper, say on the architecture, and let's say, what are the layers involved in a transformer architecture? Let's ask something like that. Okay, so what are the layers involved in the transformer architecture discussed by this paper, right? So I can ask information like that, and then it will give me a reply. So it will say, the transformer architecture discussed consists of an encoder and decoder, each made up of multiple identical layers, and then it gives me some specific information about them. So it works, it works great, right? Um, Another option that I wanted to show you guys is a famous one called Chat PDF, which has these very nice um, conversational interface for you to interact with a paper. So we can do the same thing. We can come here, copy the URL, go back, and then from URL, paste this, run. And Chat PDF is really nice because it already opens up 
in this chat interface. You can have the paper here on your left and you can have the uh, chat interface here on your right. And you can ask questions like, uh, tell me the steps for, okay, so tell me the um, basic components of a transformer architecture, right? I can come here, I can say that, and then it will look it up and then will, okay. Basic components are encoder, decoder, multi-head attention, feed forward, position encoding, residual connections, layer normalization. That's all perfect, that's all fine, that's all great. So I love this approach because as you guys can start to see, right? We're shifting from uh, this more linear take on information where we kind of like have to read everything and just process everything sequentially to this more, I don't want to say paralyzed, but I'm going to call it an augmented workflow for doing research where we can use AI to kind of like filter out the stuff that we don't want to know about the paper. And the paper becomes the thing that it was meant to be, which is a source of concrete objective information, right? I don't want to have to go through some big introduction and to all of the context around that paper to get to the core of the stuff I want to know, right? So I think these kinds of technologies are extremely interesting in that sense. So moving on from those two approaches, uh, there's another one that I really like that is um, for querying files locally. Now, there's a whole discussion right now about the importance of querying your files um, locally, because essentially when you're talking to ChatGPT, for example, right, and you send a prompt, that prompt goes to the cloud where ChatGPT is hosted. So there's a security issue associated with your information leaving your network in order for you to get a response from the model, right, using their API. And that concern led a lot of people in open source to create amazing projects like Private GPT, which essentially is a tool that allows you to ask questions to your documents without an internet connection, you, meaning locally. And that was made possible by advances in large language models in the open source arena, uh, led mostly by Lama Chu, for example, which I'm going to show you guys right here. So Lama Chu is this uh, huge, amazing large language model released by Meta, probably with the intention to kind of like uh, contain the mode from OpenAI uh, as it, as ChatGPT took over the world. And Lama Chu has just, just as good a performance as ChatGPT 2.5 Turbo. I mean, of course, we can debate whether or not it is just as good, but the point is, it's so good that you can actually do useful tasks with it, and it's open source, so you can put it in your machine and run it. Now, of course, the bigger model, the 70 billion parameter model, is, let's say, it's kind of hard to just run in a regular commercial machine, but there's so many approaches now kind of like moving towards the direction where uh, with quantization and Lama CPP, there's a bunch of stuff going on so that Lama Chu is easy to run on your local machine. For example, if you go to a website called Olama, right? Olama is one of the easiest ways for you to get up and running with uh, Lama Chu locally. I have it installed in my machine so I can show you guys a quick demo of what Olama looks like. So if I come here and I say Olama runs um, run uh, Lama Chu, there you go. And now I can ask questions like, tell me a joke about natural language processing. And it will tell me a joke about natural language processing. Let's wait for a couple of seconds. And there you go. Why did the linguist break up with his girlfriend? The punchline of the joke is meant to be humorous, it's not meant to be taken seriously. Hinwise, whatever, because you're always getting in lost in her sentence. <laughs> there you go. So as you can see, I mean, uh, you can run these models locally now, and it's super easy. And there are many other tools, just like Olama, that make it super easy for you to run them. So what is my point? My point is that now the Queer Docs space of possible tools has been hugely amplified by the availability of these open source large language models. And I actually installed private GPT and I wanna show you guys a demo of it uh, actually working here on my machine. So I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna to go to private GPT, I'm gonna go to private GPT. I'm gonna activate my environment, which is private GPT, I think. Yeah. 
and now I'm going to run private GPT uh, and uh, let's take a look now right now private GPT here is running with um, a few documents that I put on the source that I will show you guys right here so these are the source documents okay so I have a convolutional neural network paper and the Lama Chu original paper okay these are the papers that are inside the um, that I'm querying here right now with private GPT so I can say something like explain the training procedure for Lama Chu chat okay so I can use that and I can get a response now the quality of the response that we get with these open source options is going to be a bit more variable than the quality that you would get by using a traditional api like uh, ChatGPT, gpt4 and these more uh, barred or these more high quality models however that's not even necessarily true because not only open source right now in llm space is catching up to the private space and the cloud space options but there's a lot of specific options right now something like gorilla for example you guys that well, we can take a look which are starting to show the potential of these open source options or these smaller versions to be extremely good now for example uh gorilla enables lms to use tools by invoking apis right and it does this extremely well some people even arguing that it surpasses gpt4 in some uh, specific contexts so the um, the space of possibilities is really interesting. Now, coming back to my question, I asked it to explain the procedure for Lamachu Chat. It took a while, as you can see here, it took, I think, 40 seconds. So uh, a lot of people complain about latency issues with private GPT, but it does, uh, it does explain it correctly, what the model is doing. And one of my favorite features from the query your docs technology in a, in a general sense is that you have the ability to query for uh, you have the ability to retrieve the sources inside those papers from which the model was able to make the conclusions that give you the response and that is huge and we're going to touch and we're going to touch on that topic uh, in a second so this is private GPT. This is one of the options that you have. I'm, this is not going to be a video where I show you how to install these things and how to you know, run them, uh, but I'll leave a bunch of links in the description of links that can show you how to do that, okay? So moving on from private GPT, we have other interesting options like H2NO GPT. And this is a really cool one. Uh, I have it installed locally, but just to be... Um, just to be quicker, I'm going to run their own demo. So I'm going to come here and uh, I'm going to say H2O GPT, H2O, there you go. And they have an interface that is kind of like a Gradio app and you can upload documents like I can come here and can say, let's upload the convolutional neural network paper. So I just did that. So now, as you guys can see here on the left, I don't know if you guys can see, but uh, it's uh, processing the data that I just uploaded. Okay, great. So you see, it, it processed the data, doc count. So there's a bunch of, so there's one document, 87 chunks. It's a small paper. And then I can ask stuff about the paper, like um, what are the main features in convolutional neural networks that makes them more appropriate for image processing than traditional neural networks. I can say that, I can click on submit, and now we're submitting, and there's a bunch of interesting uh, things that you can do with this approach, uh, with, with, with this tool. For example, you can get responses from multiple models, as you guys can see here, which is awesome you can do a bunch of interesting stuff. I actually saw this in a Jeremy Howard video uh, that is really nice. I think it's called the Hacker's Guide for LLMs. I'll leave a link in the description because his video, his YouTube video is awesome. And Jeremy Howard is just a freaking genius. So you should definitely check him out. And, um, and as you can see, boom, local architecture. Yes, CNNs have filters, fewer connections. That's true, right? The filter just connects to the local receptive field of, the, uh, of its neurons. So as you guys can see, and we can gauge the quality of the responses of different models, like we can see GPT 3.5 be compared directly to uh, Lama 270B chat, right? 
and uh, this is another wonderful option that you have don't worry i'm going to leave a link uh, for all these options so this is not really the point of this video the point of this video is actually to talk about not lama index per se but to talk about what does it mean for learning research information when we can do semantic queries on pdfs right if we assume that we have at least a slightly like much above the average no as extremely high likelihood of getting correct responses right because this doesn't work if you're going to get bad responses all the time and there's a lot of discussion right now i'm going to show you guys a paper it's called a deep dive into the infeasibility of rag with llms and this paper is really cool it discusses all the challenges and difficulties associated with um, having retrieve augmented systems, uh, retrieve augmented generation systems to work with current large language models due to issues like hallucination, like retrieving wrong information, right? So there's a bunch of things that we have to keep in mind in when interacting with these technologies. So we shouldn't just embrace them as if they are the holy grail of finding information and learning from papers and PDFs. Okay, so that being said, we talked about AI PDF, chat PDF, private GPT, HUO GPT. And now what I want to talk about is Lama Index. Now, just like LangChain, I've done videos on LangChain before. I love LangChain. I actually have a live training course coming up on O'Reilly at the end of the year about uh, how to use LangChain. Uh, but what I love about Lama Index is that Lama Index is a new framework, relatively new, right? That allows you to do uh let's go to their github so lemma index is a new framework that allows you to do uh essentially uh you have a data framework for your llm application what does that mean it means that you can do things like the query your documents approach that we've been discussing which is four lines of code four lines of code and you have a working version of a uh, query of docs um application that you can use to query your own docs, right? They have two types of integration. They have the ChatGPT one, which is paid because you have to pay the API. And they have the open source one, which I tested the collab that they had. And I mean, because it, that relies on you having the Lama models uh, locally on your machine, that can lead to some limitations. Uh, this machine that I'm using, uh, it's a Mac M2 Pro that doesn't have a lot of RAM, so that kind of makes it hard to run certain models. So the uh, local approach might have some issues due to that, but I have no doubt that in a few months or even less, we're already going to have quantized models, quantized versions of the 70B chat or whatever, that are going to be great and, and they're going to fix that. Issue is, Lemma Index is amazing because it allows you to query your docs with very little code. Okay, so one of the points that I want to make here is that um, I think that when we think about the SQR docs RAG system pipeline, it's nice if we divide the objectives with regarding document interaction into what I call two buckets. Okay, that's what I'm doing here. So there's one bucket that's called objective document interaction and then another one that I'm calling subjective document interaction. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's uh, separate these parts so that the cells are a bit more explanatory. Now, objective document interaction, I mean, so you want a specific piece of information, but you don't remember a relevant keyword. You don't remember like something that can just give you what you need, okay? Sometimes you know the keywords, but you want something that is extremely specific and you don't have, you don't remember anything that can get you the information that you need. And there's subjective document interaction. Now, subjective document interaction is you want to discuss something based off some foundational, some like comments, um, some common texts. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, let's say you want to write a book about, I don't know, uh, the biology of volcanoes or the ecosystems of the ocean, whatever it is, right? And you have a few papers, you have a few books, let's say. And these books are kind of like foundational for what you want to discuss. You know that those are like the best source of information for your particular use case, for the essay you're writing, etc. What you can do here 
is which so subjective document interaction here would be okay uh i want to discuss with some model chgpt llama whatever it is uh the ideas that are here right you don't want to query specific information but you want the model to be aware of the contents that are inside that document or, or those documents right so that's what i'm calling subjective document interaction but that's not just that right you uh, for example open-ended learning where you want to learn some concepts and stuff but you don't necessarily want anything specific that's subjective document interaction uh, objective document interaction would be you have a math book and you want to query yourself on linear algebra and you have a great book with a bunch of interesting uh, like concepts and exercises etc and maybe you want to um, uh, ask the model hey give me like uh, create five exercises from this book where the answers can be found inside the book that would be an objective use and you can also do subjective quizzes like for example look based on this paper or in these couple of papers let's um a, create a quiz of questions that i could answer with information that's inside those papers right that would be a subjective interaction that's what i'm calling subjective document interaction now for now what i would like to do is discuss the first part so the first part is what i'm calling the first bucket which is the objective document interaction right so in the, um, in the objective document interaction, you can have pragmatic use cases. Like, let's say you want to find a contract that mentions something. So you have an embedding of those documents that you have, your personal documents. And you say, ah, I need that contract about that thing. And then boom, you get it, right? Or ah, I need an invoice of etc. whatever it is. If there's text inside of it, you can embed it and you can have a ask your docs pipeline working for you and you can find them now what about learning and research use cases now here is where what i we would just talk about it's the um you want to find objective information so you put in the papers like we just did about convolutional neural networks and you query the model for objective information inside now even though current technologies are kind of like almost at the point where they're very well suited for these use cases, we gotta take some precautions, at least if we're like building an app that other people are gonna use, right? If you're not doing something just for yourself, because, uh, because of hallucination, because of the fact that it, these systems are not 100% reliable, right? And there's a bunch of issues associated with how the embeddings are constructed, how the models query those embeddings, etc. However, if we are not so strict about what we require uh, of uh, the, from the performance of the model, right? If we don't need the model to be 100% perfect, we're okay with a little bit of uncertainty, as long as it's controlled uncertainty then in let's let's call this a middle point between objective and subjective document interaction we have a space where i think we're going to see a revolution in terms of research because for open-ended interactions this gets really really interesting imagine you're a researcher you have a bunch of papers from which you want to learn complex ideas concepts etc right so you can imagine a workflow where you embed those documents right and you can iteratively discuss with those papers and with the information and just go further and just look for, okay, I wanna know what embeddings are, how they're constructed, show me a Python snippet explaining what an embedding is, right? You can really go deeper and deeper by using an approach that leverages large language models connected with source documents, okay? And this is where I think the paradigm is going to change because by allowing this to be done programmatically, and we're going to look into Lama Index, which is a framework that allows you to do this kind of stuff, we can have, let's say, multiple questions answered at the same time, right? Now, of course, if, if we're learning the information ourselves, of course, that we're limited by the amount of information we can place inside our working memories. So it's not like we're going to learn any faster just because we can get the answers faster, right? We still have to read the answers, process them, compare, contrast, analyze, etc. However, 
when we consider that if we can have all of those, let's say, all of those first initial questions answered, and then the information that's censored from there can lead to consequences that have some kind of programmatic use. Let's say, look, if it's true that this neuron does this kind of thing, show me some code displaying that or gather evidence or go online and do this. You, you can um, make it possible to connect the consequences of learning something from a paper to do actions in the real world that have impact in the real world, right? And that can be amazing for research, right? You could use it as triggers for searching evidence about something or looking into hypotheses more uh, specifically, as well as obviously for, you know, being productive and, and logistics and business and stuff like that. But I'm more interesting, uh, I'm more interested about how it can augment our ability to learn more things but not lose on the depth, right? I don't want to just learn a bunch of information. I would like to like keep the ability to hold on the depth of what I'm learning, but I would like to know what's possible once we can have models that can semantically process so much information at once. So to, I, I know this all might sound complicated. So what I did here is I'm running a script here. It's going to download some PDFs and save it in a folder called papers, okay? So I'm doing that. So now it's saving, uh, it's saving the um, this papers to a folder called papers. And what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna use Lama index, right? I'm using the vector store index class to do the vectorization and the indexing part. And I'm gonna use the simple directory reader, which we're gonna use to load the documents that are saved inside the folder. Okay. And I have a little function here written, which essentially, when we use Lama index to query the documents, this little function is going to give me access to the source for a given answer. Okay, because we want to have control over uh, the location inside those documents from which the LLM uh, was able to deduct or derive a conclusion. And when I use the words deduct and derive, I'm using them loosely here don't think that i'm actually mean that the model is actually doing a deduction because that's a whole line of research okay so that's what i'm doing here i'm just retrieving the metadata for the name of the paper and the page and that will kind of give us a validation that when we query the paper for something um we're getting the answer from the paper that we query right because we're querying a bunch of papers so we don't know where the model is going to look and we want to know the page inside that paper so we can go and look it up and match the information, make sure it's correct. Okay. So now I'm setting the folders with PDFs variable to the folder where the papers are stored. I'm setting up directory reader to load the documents. I'm indexing those documents. Okay. And I'm here, I'm setting show progress to true so that you see a nice little uh, progress bar when we're running this code. And then I'm uh, setting up the, um, the query. So now I'm going to have a query engine, right? That comes right off the indexing that we just did with vector score index. So I can run this. So now it's going to take a few seconds and there you go. So now it's parsing documents. It parsed the documents into nodes because Lemma index divides the, um, the representation Lemma index has for documents. It's called nodes. That's the smallest chunk uh, upon which Lama index does transformations and stuff to uh, to documents, and also had doc has documents which are composed of a bunch of nodes. So it did that. It generated embeddings. So now we're ready to query, right? So I prepared a few queries here, and actually used GPT-4 to generate these queries. So I generated them uh, programmatically, but I'm not going to show you that part because I think it's uh, besides the point. And these are queries related to the papers that are inside. The papers inside there are like LLMs, attention is all you need, a survey on transformers, scaling transformers, parameter efficient tuning, a bunch of stuff that I gather, a bunch of sources that I gathered from a great blog post by Sebastian Raschke. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And uh, the blog post called Understanding Large Language Models, a Transformative Reading List. So I, I gathered like a few papers from this post, which is really good. And I advise you to, to take a look. I'm going to leave a link in the description. This paper is really good. I'm going to put it here. Source for the papers. 
and I'm going to put it actually over here. There you go. And now I'm going to loop over those questions and I'm going to query and then I'm going to print the query and the answer. And then I'm going to just print some stars so that we can see that kind of like divided. So that's the query, significance of attention mechanisms and language models, discuss attention is all you need. And then we get an answer. And then we get an answer. So um, interesting thing here for the scaling laws for transfer, the, there wasn't a lot of prior knowledge. So the model did not find a lot of relevant information for this particular question, but it's all right. So this one, training language models to form structure human feedback. It found the model. This is one of the foundational papers and I have it in my, in the documents here. Okay. So we have answers to all of these questions, right? Now, just stop, stop to think about what that means. We just answer them and imagine that we could trust these answers a hundred percent, right? That means that I could do something like, let's, let's take a look at this example. Scaling LLMs presents several challenges as identified in the context. These include issues related to factuality, toxicity, helpfulness, bias, privacy, misleading expertise claims, and potential for use cases. Okay, so let's take this answer, right? And here's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to, let me just do this, response, let me just, yeah. So this is how we get the string from the response. Okay, so now I'm going to do something different. I'm going to use the ChatGPT API just because, okay? So I'm going to write a little function here called get response. Then it's going to take in a prompt. And then here it's going to say, um, I'm going to have to open, import open AI API. This is, I'm, I'm experimenting actually on the fly. I did not prepare this part of the presentation here for you guys for this video. I'm just, I just want to show you guys what, what could be possible, this kind of stuff. And let's, I'm going to just open my GIST with the ChatGPT um, API so that I don't have to write it from scratch. ChatGPT API, call to ChatGPT. There we go. I have it here. So now I'm just going to paste it. Perfect. And open API. So now let's just test. Um, let's just test this function that I just wrote. So I'm going to say, uh, what do you think about, uh, just, let's just test it. So tell me a joke. Well, we're going to test the API call to see if it's working. Beautiful. It's working. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to take the response that we got. Remember scaling LLMs prevents several challenges. Okay. And, um, let's say we were doing a, a research workflow, right? So I could say something like prompt research one. Based on this answer uh, regarding challenges with LLMs, and then I'm going to say answer, uh, answer dot response, and then I'm going to come here. I'm going to put a, yeah. Uh, write down bullet points of follow up research. Now I wanted to make, um, let's, let's not give it any specifics. Okay. So based on this answer regarding some investigation I am doing, so I'm going to give it the answer. I'm going to skip a line, but and then write down bullet points of follow-ups, follow-up research I could do. Yeah, uh, follow-up research I could do. Um, let's make it concise to up to five bullet points. Okay, so this is my prompt. So again, based on the sensor regarding some investigation I'm doing, write down bullet points of follow-up research I could do. Let's make it concise up to five bullet points. And now I'm going to call ChatGPT and I'm going to give the prompt. So let's see what's up. It's going to read the response. It's going to take in the stuff that I asked and let's see what happens. So now it's taking a while because the the token length here is 
kind of big. All right. So we have the answer. I'm going to copy here, put in the markdown, as you guys can see. And there we have it, guys. And if this is not blowing your mind right now, I don't know what will. I'm just kidding. But why do I think this is so cool? Let's just take a look at these answers, right? So number one is said, investigate and apply fine tuning methods in the context of various large language models to explore potential and improving performance, alignment with human expectations, considering different types of human generated, pop 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 pop. Okay, let's have the answer from the query uh, here, kind of like, yeah. And I'm gonna just copy here, put in markdown, and uh, let's say presents many challenges. The challenges include factuality, toxicity, helpfulness, bias, privacy, misleading expertise claims, and potential for malicious use. These can be addressed by various approaches, fine tuning, enforcement learning with human feedback. Okay, so then the follow-ups were investigate, apply fine tuning. That's, that makes total sense with the answer. Conduct an analysis of reinforcement learning with human feedback. That's perfectly aligned with what was set in the answer. Experiment with instruction fine tuning to a certain whether combination fixes issues with factuality, toxicity, which is an issue touched upon in the answer that we just saw. Explore, explore and experiment with the potential of RL from AI feedback. So as you can see, we go from an answer to a question that we obtained from a PDF, writing to, okay, what needs to be done? right straight into okay these are the options and from here we can even go further right so we could do something like let's take let's take let's take the first i like rlhf so let's in uh, let's take okay so based on this one we could say something like answer GPT-4 equals this, right? And here, guys, I'm, I am obviously I'm doing this manually, but I just want to give you a sense. And I'm going to say, uh, create a set of actionables based off this, um, this overall research follow-up point and then i'm going to give here the answer gpt4 and uh, let's come back here let's put an f here and now let's get a follow-up and make it a concise bullet point list and i'm going to use github copilot uh, display with markdown just because I want to, I want to show you that I want to show this like nicer and directly in the prompt. There we go. Perfect. And now we run. And now I'm going to run this. It's a GPT-4 actionables. Ah, but it, it kind of, okay. That's never mind. <laughs> uh, kit. Okay, that was dumb. Okay, let's just do like this. Okay, we have it. Yeah. And now I'm just going to come here and I'm going to say from IPython. Yeah, that's what I want. And I'm just going to say markdown. And then this. And there we go. Now we're going to get a response. So we're gonna get a set of actionables based on this research, right? So now we wait for a few seconds while we obtain the response and we should see a response in a few seconds. Let's go, let's go, let's go. There you go. Conduct literature review, set up parameters, detailed planning, model preparation, run a pilot test, full scale, data analytics, comparative document files. And I mean, we could connect this to something like Autogen from Microsoft. If you don't know what Autogen is, 
is this new really wonderful tool that makes it really easy to create workflows with agents. So it's a framework to enable development of LLM applications using agents that can converse with each other to solve tasks, right? So we could hook this up to something like Autogen to make a workflow where these models are just working by themselves to reach some particular goal, task, etc. Right now, of course, we all know that this is possible. Uh, and um, my thing here is not to say let's automate everything and everything's going to be done by the AI, whatever. My point here is to showcase that the um, amplitude, the range of things that one individual can do today, if that person uses these models intelligently, is just so absolutely mind blowing that I just find it fascinating. And I think that query your docs is a really fascinating and key type of technology that we're gonna see enable some really cool advances in research beyond just making you more productive. But I think that enabling you not, learn, not only to learn more stuff, but to learn more deeply and to reach depth in a certain field much faster than you could have ever imagined before. And this is kind of like, this was uh, what I wanted to discuss with you guys today. I think this is a really fascinating kind of direction. Let me know in the comments if you have ideas, if you agree, if you disagree, uh, what kind of videos would you would like to see related to this topic or related to topics involving this intersection between artificial intelligence and uh, these kind of like programmatic approaches to learning. I think this is a really cool topic to discuss. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and see you next time. Cheers, guys.